Good morning, everybody. My name is Tammy Merrill from South South North. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the Community Adaptation Small Grants Facility, colloquially known as the SGF Project. The SGF Project implemented a grant-making mechanism using enhanced direct access to climate finance. It was the first EDA project funded by the Adaptation Fund, and it provided small grants to 12 local grant recipients. The projects that we're discussing today were located in three areas in dark blue on the map, the Namaqua District of the Northern Cape Province in Western Cape, uh, the, in the Western, sorry, in the Northern Cape Province and the Western part of South Africa, and the Mopani District in Limpopo Province in the Northeast. Climate change projections for South Africa include increased frequency and intensity of weather events, heavily impacting those in Mopani District who depend on agricultural production for subsistence and livelihoods, and those in the Namaqua whose primary livelihoods are livestock farming and fishing. Note that the Namaqua population is about 100,000 people while Mopani is about a million. The subsectors were determined through vulnerability assessments conducted in the regions, which noted that agriculture, livelihoods, and settlements were not only at high risk of climate impacts, but also determined as a priority by the communities themselves. Presented here is the project organogram. Getting money to local grant recipients required the support of many stakeholders. The Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries was the national designated authority, while the South African National Biodiversity Institute, SANBI, was the project grant recipient and dispersed all funds. Civil society, however, played were key enablers to ensure that small grant recipients were able to receive the funding and adequately implement their respective projects. As national implementing entity, SANBI had oversight and reporting responsibilities relating directly to the adaptation fund, and they subsequently distributed funds to the executing entity, South South North. Financial and technical due diligence rested with South South North, who coordinated and managed the granting process and distributed funds directly to facilitating agencies and the awarded grant recipients. Technical input and strategic direction during the grant application process and project implementation was supported by the project advisory group, which included the whole project management team and two municipalities. Facilitating agencies played a very important role, which I'll discuss in the next slide. And each of the facilitating agencies in each of the two regions developed their own technical advisory groups. And they also played a critical role in promoting locally led initiatives that were contextualized to the practical needs on the ground. In addition, this local support, particularly the, the support of the municipalities, increased project sustainability. So why was SGF business unusual? Well, for several reasons. The project governance structure integrated many stakeholders, and this facilitated access to expertise and information, uh, as well as support with some government processes. The beneficiaries at the community level were involved throughout the project. Proof needed to be provided that all beneficiaries approved of the project design and the activities and sustainability plans were often needed to be signed off by local leaders or cooperatives. Um, despite this, grant recipients did complain about onerous or cumbersome reporting requirements. Throughout the project, uh, a lot of attempts were made to be responsive to local needs. Alternative contracting mechanisms were arranged through tripartite agreements to ensure that more community-based organizations and cooperatives had access to the grant and customized training was provided as well as additional money for 
interventions. And the facilitating agencies. They were a unique innovation playing a critical role in translating the global expectations of the adaptation fund and the monies associated with it into practicable measures on the ground. Um, each of the facilitating agencies had an existing footprint in their respective areas, understood local needs, and provided considerable capacity building. We couldn't do adaptation in isolation. We had to incorporate development as well, and we had to justify it. So, but this approach recognized and articulated the differences between adaptation and development while acknowledging the community's priorities holistically. There was a lot of capacity building that took place throughout the life, lifespan of the project and not only on adaptation technology and project implementation, but also financial management and grant management. And finally, formally facilitated events, as well as informal exchanges via WhatsApp groups formed, these relationships helped facilitate cross-learning, and in some cases, projects added additional interventions based upon examples that they saw through these learnings. Although the SGF aligned with most of the principles in some way or another, the primary strengths were the devolved decision-making and the inclusion of women and indigenous peoples. Part of the eligibility cr criteria was to ensure that indigenous peoples uh, were included and that women not only benefited, but were involved in the project management structures. Gender and youth were disaggregated in all results. Each of the three investment windows, climate resilient livelihoods, climate smart agriculture, and climate proof settlements, uh, included a variety of interventions. And often those interventions were integrated to provide added value and improve sustainability. I'll quickly go through a couple of examples. This example, the Gantata Rainwater Harvesting System and Rain Gauge Project based in the Mopani District sought to promote climate resilience through increased access to water and fodder for livestock and nutritious foods for community members. The installation of rainwater harvesting systems in 115 homes, the rehabilitation of local dams and construction of gabions to reduce soil erosion sought to increase access to safe water and increase community resilience. 2,800 people benefited from this project. Another project, the Biodiversity and Meat Cooperative Land and Livestock Adaptation Project, based in the Namaqua District, aimed to introduce hardier indigenous livestock that were more resilient to heat and disease, grazed less selectively, and still fetched premium prices. This project, focused on developing livestock management processes, including appropriate vaccinations, dipping, and medication of livestock. Over a thousand people in the Namaqua region benefited from this project. The SGF journey was a long one that ultimately lasted over five years. What we learned is that, is that a balance must be achieved between robust oversight structures and agile systems that are responsive to local needs. This requires a system that evolves with the needs of the project and ensures that beneficiaries remain central implementers and decision makers throughout. Responsive capacity building and applying a holistic approach is also required to ensure that EDA is not just a means, but that it facilitates the end result of resilient, healthy, and prosperous individuals and communities. Increased and accelerated adaptation funding is desperately needed to ensure that vulnerable, po vulnerable populations can not only thrive, not only survive, but thrive the impending climate crisis. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tammy. What an excellent and clearly received message there. I have just one clarifying question for you, Tammy. Um, if you were to support other organizations um, to replicate your local funding model uh, or approach, what would be the key recommendations or lessons that you'd like to share? There would be many, but I think I'll start with just sort of the, 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 the most important. I think the first one is, is that that devolved decision making power. So the SGF did, I think, an extraordinary job of trying to develop a governance model that devolved decision making power. Although I think the next iteration should take that another step further. So there would there should be mechanisms that sort of feed back to the donor or at least the the um, grant recipient to ensure that the voices on the ground are heard and are able and their lessons and their priorities are able to be fed back into the decision making processes so that so that the this governance system and the support and the associated funding can be agile and responsive. Um, I think that's one thing. Um, I think that we need to ensure we have time, which is another principle. So this project was a five year project. Unfortunately, this was the first funded EDA project by the Adaptation Fund. It took us over two years just to get our governance structures together, the protocols in place. So by the time that the grants were awarded, they only had a year or two to implement, and it wasn't enough time. Adaptation takes time and ongoing support. Um, I think the other thing it would be capacity building. Capacity building is key, and not just with the local organizations. We're talking, we are all learning together. So even the high level organizations at, at national level are also learning and need to approach it from a perspective that, that we're learning together. We're co-creating and we're, we're a part of a journey together. And, and that's the capacity building at local level um, needs to be that not transactional, but co-creative. And then the final thing I'm gonna say is just that, you know, local level costs need to be understood, including the in-kind benefit from communities. I think we often think like, oh, but they live there, it's fine. Um, it, it actually is taking people's productive time and energy away from earning money or taking care of your kids to be involved in these community proper uh, projects and they need to be acknowledged and understood. And local NGOs can't absorb um, any costs. There's no absorptive opportunity for them just to say, okay, well, we're going to do these reports for free because the project is closed. Local CBOs have to have funding to be able to do all of the requirements of the project, um, including after closeout, audits, those kinds of things. So I hope I didn't go on. Those would be some really key lessons I think we learned from our project.